Why did J.K. Rowling want to kill off Arthur and Ron Weasley? And what actually stopped her from doing that? Which Hogwarts professor was supposed to be a vampire? And how would Hermione's little sister become a part of our favorite trio? Hi, I'm Clive. Let's dive right in. Rest in peace, Mr. Weasley. Look, Harry Potter was never like Game of Thrones, where people died left, right, and center. That series remains the undisputed master of toying with your emotions. Still, Rowling wasn't afraid of killing her darlings when she felt it necessary. One of the characters that survived the mighty swipe of her pen, though, was Arthur Weasley. If you read The Order of the Phoenix, you'll know that he nearly met the Grim Reaper's sickle after battling Voldemort's snake, Nagini. In the earlier drafts, however, Rowling didn't spare Mr. Weasley. But she had a change of heart, telling today, if there's one character I couldn't bear to part with, it's Arthur Weasley. I think part of the reason for that is there were very few good fathers in the book. In fact, you could make a very good case for Arthur Weasley being the only good father in the whole series. Of course, the Weasleys weren't spared trauma in the series, as Fred lost his life later on. That being said, those weren't the only two Weasleys whom Rowling had in her crosshairs, but we'll be covering that shocking detail a little later on, so stick around. Vampires at Hogwarts No, we're not talking about Robert Pattinson's appearance in Harry Potter, but wouldn't that be an interesting crossover with Twilight? Jokes aside, vampires were actually mentioned in the series, but they weren't really explored in too much detail. Rowling did consider having a vampire teacher called Professor Trocar at one point. Not sure if they'd be the professor of sucking blood or turning into a bat, but the author liked the idea of introducing a bloodsucker into the wizarding world. The more she thought about it, however, the less it became appealing. Rowling wrote on Pottermore the following, The vampire myth is so rich and has been exploited so many times in literature and on film. I felt there was little I could add to the tradition. Well, all the werewolf fans will definitely be cheering since they won this round with the addition of Professor Lupin here. Who knows, maybe a bloodsucker could still make an appearance in a spin-off or even the Harry Potter TV show. Never say never. Draco's original surname. Did you know that the surname Malfoy is from the old French words mal and foi, which directly translates to bad faith? It's pretty apt when you think about it. Just hearing the word makes you think of a villain. But it could have been different, like entirely different. Initially, Rowling considered some <clears throat> interesting options for Draco and his family. She revealed that his last name was originally meant to be Spongin. Seriously. Thankfully, she decided it was a bad idea before toying with a few other choices, such as Smart and Sphinx, before settling on Malfoy. Truthfully, Spongin makes you think of a sponge cake and those who don't strike fear into the heart of anyone, though they're tasty and the perfect accompaniment to tea or coffee. Still, Spongin is not nearly as bad as Hermione's original surname, Puckle. Well, they do call it a first draft for a reason, right? But we're not finished discussing Draco just yet. The biggest bully on the block. Draco might have paraded around like he was the Brock Lesnar of Hogwarts, but there was someone else who wanted to claim his yard. Rowling admitted that Theodore Knott, a pureblood son of a Death Eater, was set to be a bigger bully than Draco. The two would have ended up forming an alliance, because they're Slytherin, duh. However, Theodore was supposed to be smarter than Draco, and perhaps even more sneaky and dangerous. In the end, the character was just briefly mentioned in the Philosopher's Stone in the fifth book, but he wasn't really a key player in the story. If Theodore had been emphasized or given a bigger role, it's unlikely that Draco would have played the part that he did. Instead, he'd probably end up being a stooge for him. So, all in all, the right decision was made to minimize Theodore's role in favor of Draco here. The death of Ron Weasley? Stop the bus. No, not Ron. As it turns out, Rowling must have been taking some notes from George R.R. R. Martin because she seriously considered offing one of the most beloved and popular characters. It was quite the revelation from the author who said, I planned from the start that none of them would die, but then midway through, which I think is a reflection of the fact that I wasn't in a very happy place, I started thinking I might polish one of them off, out of sheer spite. She didn't mince her words and said that Ron was the chosen one to take the fall here. But she finally saw reason and realized that might be one step too far for the readers. It just didn't need to be done. I mean, there was enough heartache in Harry Potter with the likes of Snape, Dumbledore, and Sirius Black all meeting their end, so there was no need to add Ron to the casualty list here. Sorry, but it would have been simply unforgivable to kill off Ron. A Granger Saves Harry 
While most of the parents play significant roles in the books, Hermione's were merely passive observers, only showing up briefly and never really impacting the story much. But this was drastically different in the early drafts of the Philosopher's Stone. In this version of the story, the Potters stayed on an island and the Grangers lived on the shore close to them. Hermione's parents would have heard the screams in the evening that the Potters perished and Mr. Granger would have gone over to inspect. And he would have been the one to find the baby Harry among the wreckage. Naturally, this role was fulfilled by Hagrid in the final version of the story. But it's an interesting premise, as it would have created a deeper connection between Harry and Hermione's past. That being said, the way it actually turned out wasn't bad either. But tell us, which version would you have wanted to read? The Unexpected Slytherin When you think of the Weasleys, you wouldn't exactly associate them with the likes of Slytherin. Their family almost got a bad rap, though, in the Goblet of Fire. Originally, the plan was to introduce Mafalda, the daughter of Molly's second cousin, a squib and a muggle. The child was disliked by Mrs. Weasley and pretty much everyone else who found her to be a show-off and someone who loved to listen in on other people's conversations. The best part about her? She would have been sorted into Slytherin House and become a rival for Hermione. At the same time, she would have also also provided Death Eater intel to Harry and his friends, thus making her an unlikely ally and friend in the end. Rowling mentioned that she liked the character and didn't want to cut her, but ultimately she felt too far from the book's central part, so she had to remove her. Honestly, it sounds like Mafalda would have been quite the character, but if Rowling thinks she'd add too much confusion, who are we to argue with the author of one of the most successful book franchises of all time? Hermione's Long Lost Sister Wait, what? Yep, folks, Rowling told the BBC that her plan was to introduce Hermione's younger sister after a few years. She said, I always planned that Hermione would have a younger sister, but she's never made an appearance, and somehow it feels like it might be too late now. Basically, she kind of forgot to write her into the books. With such a massive world and so much to take into consideration, who can blame her for the odd thing slipping her mind? And Rowling was right. It would have been a little too late to introduce the younger Granger into the story by that time. But how would it have changed the dynamic of Harry Potter? Would Hermione's sister have been welcomed by the gang with open arms? Or would she have been completely different from her elder sibling? It seems like a question that we'll never know the answer to now. But perhaps there's still a story to be told at another stage. After all, it's not uncommon in fiction for characters to have long-lost brothers or sisters whom they've never known about. I mean, Days of Our Lives built up an entire decade or three of storylines around that premise. So who's to say that can't happen here as well? The Final Last Words for most authors, the words the end sound like the best way to finish a book or series. But Rowling spent a lot of time questioning how she wanted to close off her iconic story. As we all know, All Is Well was how the series ended, even if it wasn't part of the original plan. Rowling was determined for Scar to be the last thing that fans read. Speaking about why she wanted to do it, she said, I wanted a very concrete statement that Harry won and that the Scar, although it's still there, is now just a Scar. It's easy to understand why Rowling would have wanted to end like this, since it had closed the loop and basically finished the tale on a positive note. At the same time, All Is Well is extremely hopeful. It doesn't say the story is over or that it'll never continue. It just lets the characters have a happy moment that can be interpreted whichever way you'd like. Heck, imagine if Rowling had ended with a spell that actually closes the book? Now that would be pure magic! Would you like to go down the wormhole and find out more about Harry Potter? Well then, you need to check out our video about crazy fan theories that actually make a lot of sense. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for some more awesome videos. Thanks for tuning in.